Hello my friends and welcome back to my channel. My name is David and today we have part four of the Summer of the Silmarils discussion in the Silmarillion. So this is a read-along that Steve Donahue, uh, Scott Danielson, and myself have been doing for the month of July where we read the entirety of the Silmarillion. We broke it into four parts. Uh, and we read a part each week and made a video about it. And so this is the final of those. Uh, I'm the last one getting mine up, uh, and that's okay. Uh, I'll uh, have a, a playlist that I'm putting together for all of the 12 videos. So if you're coming late and want to read the Silmarillion and kind of follow along with our thoughts and discussions along the way, uh, there will be an easy way for you to do that. But definitely go and watch both of their videos because they are excellent. Really enjoyed uh, Scott's insights as a first time reader of the Silmarillion. And of course, tremendously enjoyed Steve's thoughts as a returning reader of the Silmarillion. This is probably my, it's either my fourth or fifth reread of, or read of this book. So, uh, and I really enjoyed it. As I said in my Friday Reads video last week, this is would be 10 out of 5 stars if you know that, that was a possible thing to do. Uh, th this may be my top book ever um, at this point in time. I, I absolutely love it. I, it's a more rich experience each and every time I read it. Part 3 um, is the, the, the section that's probably the high point for most readers that are new to the book, although it could be argued that the Akelabeth and of the Rings in the Third Age, uh, which are the two parts that conclude this book, might actually be the feature for most people because they're the ones that cover things that are um, you're more familiar with. But before we get there, we have two more chapters of the Valaquinta. Uh, or of the, the, the Quintus Silmaril, uh, which is going to talk about uh, the aftermath, kind of, from Turin Turumbar. Um, we're coming upon the end of the, the time of the Silmarils. And essentially, the descendants of the guy who made the Silmarils, Feanor, um, took an oath that no one else will possess the Silmarils but them. Uh, and so that leads to strings of tragedy and really poor decision-making along the way. And we see that reflected again in those last two chapters. Uh, Steve has some really great summaries on that. Um, but I'm going to look and see. I think I had a spot that I was going to read out of The Voyage of Arendelle. Yeah, let's talk about The Voyage of Arendelle and the War of Wrath. So Arendelle, for those that aren't knowledgeable about Tolkien and his whole um, writing, so Arendelle is a, comes from an old English poem. It was a name that Tolkien ran across as he was reading a poem in Old English because he was a linguist, and Arendelle is what prompted him to start thinking of this legendarium of Middle Earth and all of this. Um, and so Arendelle features here as a mariner who attaches a Silmaril to the prow of his ship and sails it into uh, the, the sky, uh, essentially, at the end of the story. But uh, he goes to find the beings who helped create the world and ask for their help in resolving this conflict. Um, and and the Silmaril is what was needed. It was the key to bring them back to help resolve things. And let's see here. So he goes to um, the shores of Valinor.
So let's just go right here. Uh, now, when the first tidings came to Madros that Elwing yet lived and dwelt in possession of the Silmaril by the mouths of Syrian, he, repenting of the deeds in Doriath, withheld his hand. But in time the knowledge of their oath unfulfilled returned to torment him and his brothers, and gathering from their wandering hunting paths, they sent messages to the havens of friendship and yet of stern demand. Then Elwing and the people of Syrian would not yield the jewel which Baron had won and Luthien had worn, and for which Dior the fair was slain. And least of all, while Arendelle, their lord, was on the sea, for it seemed to them that the Silmaril lay the healing and the blessing that had come upon their houses and the ships. And so there came to pass the last and cruelest of the slayings of elf by elf, and that was the third and of the great wrongs achieved by this accursed oath. So a reminder that the, this oath they swore nobody else should possess the Silmaril uh, has led now to three slaughterings of elf by elf, uh, which is a very tragic thing. It's something that uh, shouldn't have ever happened, uh, but it was all prompted by this selfish oath that spurs so many of these chapters. For the sons of Feanor that yet lived came down suddenly upon the exiles of Gondolin and the remnants of Doriath and destroyed them. In that battle, some of their people stood aside and some few rebelled and were slain upon or the other part aiding Elwing against their lords. For such was the sorrow and confusion in their hearts of the Eldar in those days. But Madros and Maglor won the day, though they remained, they alone remained thereafter the sons of Feanor, for both Amrod and Amrus were slain. Too late the ships of Curdan and Gilgalad, the high king, came hasting to the aid of the elves of Syrian, and Elwing was gone and her sons. Then such few of that people as did perish did not perish in the assault and joined themselves to Gilgalad, and they went with him to Balar, and they told that Elros and Elrond were taken captive, but Elwing, with the Silmaril upon her breast, had cast herself into the sea. Thus Madros and Maglor gained not the jewel, but it was not lost, for Ulmo bore up Elwing out of the waves, and he gave her the likeness of a great white bird, and upon her breast there shone as a star the Silmaril, and she flew over the water to seek Arendelle, her beloved, on a time of night the Arendelle at the helm of his ship saw her come toward him as a white cloud exceeding swift beneath the moon as a star over the sea moving in a strange course a pale flame of wings of storm and it is sung that she fell upon from the air upon the timbers of Vingalot in a swoon nigh unto death for the urgency of her speed and Arendelle took her to his bosom but in the morning with marveling eyes he beheld his wife in her own form beside him with her fair hair upon his face and she slept. So that's the beginning of Arendelle's voyage and his love, Elwing, and how he came to have the Silmaril on the ship. And he goes and asks for help and they get the help. And once again, the sons of Feanor have a, a, a chance to give up the Silmarils, but they covet them and want nobody else to possess them and hold to the oath. And it leads to tragedy. And at the end, the Silmarils actually pass out of Middle-earth. And from there, we go into the Kelebeth, which is the downfall of Numenor. And there's so many little Easter eggs that you can look for in here. Uh, it's going to tell you about the beginnings of a lot of familiar names. You're going to hear about the Dunedain and how they are descended from the Numenors, which will give you some hints about Aragorn and his age and how he has such a long age and the great power that's within him. Uh, it all gets descended from these sorts of... Uh, from the, the Numenor, and it's got a lot of story of Sauron, and I think that's the part that people will probably find most fascinating in these final two parts of the book, is hearing about Sauron, and there's conflict, and Sauron uh, in the Akelabeth is takes on a fair form, 
and goes and is a, an advisor and seems to be a good guy uh, for all intents and purposes. But he's behind the scenes, of course, working for the ill of everything because, you know, Sauron has to be bad. He's the great big bad in Lord of the Rings, so there there can't be any genuine nugget of good for him, correct? Although it does say at one point in time he has a chance to go one way or the other, and it is to his own misfortune that he goes the way he does. And at the end of the Akelabeth, he's driven away and loses the ability to take on a fair form any longer. Now, Sauron is a Maiar, and so if you get all the words confused, that, that's okay. But Maiar essentially means that Sauron himself is an immortal person. He, he can't be killed for good, um, which lends itself to the question, okay, so end of Lord of the Rings, the ring's destroyed, Sauron's destroyed, is he dead? Uh, and the answer to that is probably not. However, you, you find that in his defeats, he's he's able to come back time and again, um, but usually in a more diminished way. And we saw that as well with Melkor, is that uh, time and time again, the longer he was dwelling in Middle-earth, the, the more times that he was defeated and had to come back, he would lose a little bit of himself in the remaking. And so the, the thought with Sauron at the end of the Third Age with the destroying of the ring, um, because we, we find that he's able to rebuild himself uh, with greater ease into the, the, the necromancer in Mirkwood and all of those things, and that he's able to come back and force quicker because of that one ring. And having poured himself into that ring and with its making, uh, it its presence allows him to kind of come back quicker, strong, you know, still strong. But with that being destroyed, his power is probably so greatly diminished that uh, he, he's going to be a, a non-entity that's just kind of hanging out, not able to regain a form. My guess is uh, he, he's probably going to be dwelling somewhere where it's going to still feel sinister. Uh, because his presence will probably still have some sort of an impact if he's still lingering in Middle Earth. But we don't actually know any of that. It, it's all realm of speculation. Uh, and there's lots of those things that um, fans of Tolkien's works would want answers from and would think that, oh, I can turn here to find those answers. And while there's going to be some fun nuggets, you're going to get to learn things like the the Dunedain and their, their beginnings and how old Elrond is and how he came to be and how old Galadriel was and what she was able to do and how Luthien is just so pretty. Steve, that was for you. Um, you know, you, you get little fun things along the way. And I wanted to briefly mention the thing that Steve really talked about, which is the, the final one, the of the rings of power in the third age where the tales come to their end and it gives a 30,000 foot view of the narrative of basically what's going to happen over the course of the thousand pages in Lord of the Rings and this is going to be compressed into like a handful of pages and that was something I never really fully considered until watching Steve's video and he was talking about it. And it brings up a really interesting point that you, you look at the richness of all of the story of Lord of the Rings and the characters that come into play. And most of them don't get a mention in this chapter in the Silmarillion and this part. You know, you, you hear Frodo the ring bearer, you hear about Aragorn the king but you, you miss all of those things. You don't hear Legolas and Gimli. You don't hear about Eowyn, uh, any of those other key players. Side players, sure, but they have such key moments along the way in the narrative, and you don't hear a thing about them in that. And he, he says that how much of the rest of the stories here in the Silmarillion 
go that same way to where there's even more that you don't hear about, you don't get to experience because these are essentially a history being passed down by those of Elvish descent. Um, and and you, you lose something in the hasty retelling. And that's why most of these are more challenging to read because they are told from that 30,000 foot view where you don't get the individual feats and accomplishments and emotions and the, the dialogue. You get the overview of what was said, what was done. You might get a few cinematic moments here and there. But apart from Turin Turinbar and Baron and Luthien's stories, you don't really get any cohesive one-shot story narratives. And it, it brings up an interesting thought of how, how many more tales could have come out of this in a longer form. And there's a lot of stuff to mine out there of Tolkien, and I haven't read all of it by any means. I've barely cracked into my 12-volume Histories of Middle-Earth, and I know there's some good stuff in there because the first two books in there are the books of Lost Tales to where they're stories that didn't make publication, didn't make the cut. Um, there's a book of Unfinished Tales, which it's been probably about five years since I've read it, and I'm due for a reread of that book. Um, there's the books like Baron and Luthien, uh, and all of those to where they have longer and multiple copies of Tolkien's writing through that one same story so you can see how it kind of grew and developed and was changed and shifted over time with notes and commentary from Christopher Tolkien. And there's a lot of good stuff in all of those. Um, are any of those going to give us the definitive answers on, okay, what, what was going on? No, but it, it's interesting to think about. When you look back at the Silmarillion, and I think I, if I reread it right now, I'd have even more renewed vision, fresher eyes looking at it after watching Steve's video and hearing that idea of, okay, we just got Lord of the Rings compressed down into, you know, 10, 15 pages. And I'll think of all those things that you miss out on in this, you know, it still gives you a, a good and accurate version of the story. But it, it's the sweeping arc. It's the sweeping narrative. You just get the outline, so to speak. And how many stories get that treatment in here that could be expanded? And conversely, how many stories that we're familiar with, not even considering Tolkien, could we take and compress those down and still have an interesting and engaging thing to read, but would lose something in that telling? Not necessarily in a bad way. You know, Game of Thrones fans, could, could you break that down into a 20-page overall summary? Probably. Um, you'd lose a lot of those moments along the way, but it, it, it's a fascinating thing to think about. And how many histories uh, can, even from our world, can you go and pull and get an idea of what happened? But it's not the same as if you pull a volume that covers a single person's life or a single battle or major conflict. It, and and it's, it deepens my appreciation for what Tolkien did here um, and what he set out to do. And he, he stuck true to that and what he worked on. Um, as a reminder, Tolkien wrote the Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, The Silmarillion. The stories in here was what he started on first. They were started during the Great War, and they have a lot of reactions to that Great War. A lot of The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, all of those have reactions to the, the, the death and the violence and the, the loss of life from the Great War, being World War One. But he lamented that Britain did not have a mythology. Of its own. They had King Arthur, but they, they didn't have a rich 
deep rooted mythology in the way that you know you look at the Greeks, the Romans, um, the Norse, they all have a deep rooted mythology. And he wanted that for his own people. And that's what he set out to create was a mythology. And when you read this like it is a mythology, a backstory of the events that shaped the world that we know today, and the, the, the different things that happened, and he in a way succeeds at doing what he set out to do. Does it make it the most readable thing when you grab the Silmarillion and consider it that way? Um, if you don't consider it that way, no, it doesn't. But if you start to look at it, it's, he's setting out to make that mythological history shaping the world. And you can see that, yeah, it, he kind of does succeed at what he set out to do here. Uh, he did a, a great job with it. And it's something that I will always enjoy going back and rereading. And I hope that you enjoyed reading it, whether it was your first time or the second, third, whatever, however many times. Uh, I, I hope you enjoyed the journey through the Silmarillion. And now Steve had mentioned that he wanted to maybe keep this going and go into a different book by Tolkien. And of course, I'm all in on that. Um, December, I'm hosting a Let's Read the, the Hobbit. And then January through June of next year, we're going to go one part at a time through the Lord of the Rings and kind of crawl our way through it. And this is something that, you know, Steve Donahue might add himself to. Great. I'm okay with that. But even if not, uh, whatever Steve decides that he wants to do, if he says, hey, let's read, you know, the, the Book of Lost Tales Part 1 or Unfinished Tales uh, in August, I'm, I'm in on that. I, I will always read a Tolkien book. Uh, I, I, it doesn't take much to convince me. So uh, there may be plans for that coming up. I hope they are, uh, because there are some that are on my shelf that I'd like to read, and there are many that I need to pick back up, uh, that I need a, an excuse to go and pick them up and prioritize picking those up. So uh, hopefully this is not the last of the Tolkien videos until December, but uh, I hope you have a, a wonderful day. Leave a comment down below if there's a particular book from Tolkien that you would definitely like to see uh, us read through and go along with. So I'd be curious what everybody would be most interested in. Uh, thank you for watching.